I think what we're going to see is growth uh, continue to be on the softer side, but growth continue to show resilience. Uh, we don't see a near-term recession. This has to provide more pressure towards accelerating the transition to clean energy, but it's going to be a bumpy road to get there. Where we do provide further support for people, it should be temporary, timely, and targeted. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on this Tuesday, the 7th of June. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. Boris Johnson survives a confidence vote, but the mutiny suggests his days as prime minister may be numbered. The RBA hikes rates by a jumbo 50 basis points, but points to inflation spiraling higher than expected even a month ago. Bloomberg's Commodities Index hits an all-time high. And Elon Musk revives his assertion that Twitter has a bot problem in a filing on Monday. The stock trades $15 below his offer price. So first thing is first, let's check in on the markets. So we look at the RBA, we look at uh, some of the risk off mood out there. Again, investors actually fretting about monetary policy, what that means for growth and what that means for certain valuations. The fact that surging borrowing costs will definitely dent growth. And that means they're now getting rid of risk assets. I don't know whether this will be short lived or actually long lived, but you can see the S&P futures down three tenths of a percent. I think we're seeing a similar move into these European stocks. We look at yields at 3.02. And then Bitcoin, why not? Bitcoin at 29.56. Yen, extremely interesting to look at this pairing, 132. A lot of investors and a lot of traders saying this could also touch 135. It's actually for Yen at a 20-year low. Now, the picture across Europe is one of wait and see because it is on Thursday that we have the ECB. This would be a huge uh, policy shift from what we've heard in the ECB. I think money markets, 50% pricing in a 50 basis point hike. Again, this would be a huge move. We're just speaking to Laura Cooper of BlackRock. She was saying that's not their base case scenario. So you have the FTSE flat, the DAX down some six tenths of a percent, the FTSE maybe in Italy and the CAC 40 down four tenths of a percent. So the Aussie dollar and three year yields have spiked after the RBA delivered a bumper 50 basis point hike. Now for more, we're joined by Bloomberg's chief Asia economics correspondent, Enda Curran. So first of all, Enda, why did the RBA make this big move and especially why did it surprise markets? Well, it seems to be all about energy costs in particular, Francine. There was a line in the statement that uh, the energy outlook has changed from even a month ago, in fact. Now, the RBA have said they will do whatever is necessary to contain inflation, so that does suggest uh, interest rates in Australia will continue to go up from here. The broader statement was somewhat upbeat on the economy, though. It was pointing to a very strong labour market. It was also saying that house prices, even though they've come off their tops, are still 25% higher than where they were ahead of the pandemic. So obviously a very hawkish move. Markets didn't expect it. Only a handful of economists saw it coming. And it does put the RBA now in that bracket of central banks that are hiking rates by, by jumbo amounts in Mongo. Um, we also have end of this great story on the Bloomberg terminal. I've also pushed that on social media. It's a tongue twister. So we're seeing peak inflation signs flashing in chips, shipping and fertilizer. So could we see signs of peak inflation globally? I won't try that tongue twister, Francine, but I think <laughs> that is the view now. Among you know, a lot of people watching this do look to these key parts of the supply chain to see where the, some of the stress is being relieved, and we are seeing some relief in shipping uh, and in fertilizer prices, like you mentioned, with the easing of the Shanghai lockdown. That's expected to have a flow-on effect in terms of global supply chains. But then the big question becomes: even if inflation has peaked. When does it start coming back to the kind of levels that the central banks around the world target and, of course, levels that consumers on the high street are fairly comfortable with? And we are a long way from that at the moment. I mean, prices remain very elevated. There's an ongoing shock going through global food and energy markets, and nobody sees that reversing in a hurry. Uh, but for now, at least, perhaps there's some evidence we're at the peak. But obviously, we've got a long way to go before we get back to uh, pre-pandemic levels. Yeah, we do have a long way to go. Thank you so much. And as always, Bloomberg's Chief Asia Economics Correspondent there, Enda Curran. Now we're joined to talk about the markets by Saira Malik, Chief Investment Officer at Nuveen. Saira, thank you for joining us. First of all, Nuveen, I mean, I know everybody knows Nuveen, but you have a lot of money under assets uh, or under management, $1.2 trillion. Are you nervous about all of this monetary policy shifts, how to deal with inflation and the fact that it could hurt growth? 
Well, it's definitely a different world out there, and our clients are nervous. The European Union is dealing with the same issues that the U.S. is, and that's three issues. Higher, uh, higher inflation, hits to economic growth, and higher interest rates. But dissimilar to the U.S., we think there's more concern in the European Union because of geopolitical risks in places such as Russia, Ukraine, and China. And it's going to be a fine line for the central banks over here to raise interest rates, to fight inflation, while also trying to keep those growth rates from declining too much. We think that's going to be a challenge for this region. So, Sarah, do, do you expect actually some kind of policy mistake? And again, money markets are actually expecting by July 50 basis point hikes, or at least 50 percent of the money markets are saying that. I mean, that seems huge, especially if you believe what Christine Lagarde, the president, has been saying. Yeah, the risk around a policy mistake has to do with that path of interest rates. Hopefully, we'll get more clarity on that this week. Is it going to be 25 or 50? And also, how front end loaded is it going to be? I think it's tough because while we're talking about peak inflation, we look at inflation as more like plateauing from here. So how quickly can they battle inflation without taking such a hit to economic growth is a challenge. It increases the chances of that policy mistake. So where do you see value? What are you buying right now? Well, we like companies that have tailwinds. So higher interest rates are good for banks. We also like the high-end consumer who is resilient in this kind of environment. And with China reopening, it's good for high-end luxury goods companies like Caring. They have an analyst day coming up. You know, very strong brands from YSL, Gucci recovering on China reopening, good uh, cost management at Caring. And then on the bank side, ING, high-quality management team. Valuations are cheap for banks. They could increase their ROA at their up ROE at their upcoming investor day and strong cost management from them too. I mean, I actually saw the Gucci film recently. It was a, it was long, but it was it was interesting to see all the too. family d dynamics. Where are you expecting China? I mean, there, there's a lot of hope in the markets yesterday. Certainly, that China's reopening. It was certain you know big cities were reopening, but it's not a given that they stay open. So, how do you deal with that as an investor? We're somewhat cautious on China, too, because it's been fits and starts. While they're reopening now, we could see further lockdowns going forward. Also, regulatory issues in China, we see them kind of alleviating and then coming back on more strongly. Cautious in that area. We like caring because they tend to be performing well even without China. We think that's upside for them and a silver lining, but we like the company even without China reopening. So you like high-end luxury? And, I mean, retailers have a tough time. Some of them don't really know whether they can pass on this consumer infl or this inflation to the consumers. That's exactly right. Pricing power is key for, for these companies. High-end consumers should hold up in this kind of environment. We have seen a tough environment for retail. Partly that's in companies that have goods and services. We saw it with Walmart and Target in the U.S. A shift in spending from goods to services, high inventories in those areas, and then you don't have the pricing power in place. Consumers are sensitive to inflation, but if you have a strong brand name with a lot of brand heat, like Caring does with Gucci and YSL and brands like that, then I think they are more resilient in this kind of environment. Um, Sarah, we're talking a little bit there about you know possible signs of peak inflation, and again, it's a tongue twister, which I'm not. I said it once and I said it correctly. I'm not going to say it again. I mean, do you see signs that it, it could get easier from here, or are we underestimating still the impact of the, the Ukraine war? The key to watch will be wage inflation. You know, in the U.S., we're seeing some signs of it moderating in certain areas, but it remains pretty strong overall. The labor markets are strong uh, mostly around the world, and that's going to be a challenge. So, you know, as we increase interest rates, you know, will we see some cracks in the labor force? We're seeing some hiring freezes and layoffs starting to occur. That could dampen wage inflation, but until we see that as a sustainable uh, sign of it becoming less hot, I think it's going to be challenged. Inflation may peak. Uh, but it's going to plateau from here and not go back to pre-pandemic levels. Um, Sarah, so in the luxury space you like caring, you also mentioned the banking space as interest rates go up. You like ING. Is that on cost control? We like ING on cost control, but also they're very leveraged to higher interest rates. We think they could increase their ROE targets at their upcoming analyst day. Their net interest income could continue to improve from here. So we like them for a lot of reasons, not just uh, a good management team with conscious control over costs, but also okay. some nice tailwinds to their top line growth going forward because of higher rates. Is there anything that you'd be selling off at the moment? I don't know if you had a position on tech stocks and whether valuations just make little sense now. We actually like growth stocks here because as the economy slows, these stocks should actually start to perform even better because they're more resilient when it comes to slowing economic growth. Areas we don't like are consumer staples. That's been where investors have been hiding year to date because they're worried about what's going on in the global economies. Those stocks look expensive to us and they tend to have just low single digit growth. Another area we do like is energy. Within, within the commodity space, we have a strong view on energy since last year, tight supply, strong demand, and most importantly, uh, producer discipline. They're returning cash to shareholders, um, which will keep the cycle tight for many years to come.
Anything specifically on the energy? I mean, there's also the transition. We had a great piece actually on the Bloomberg Terminal looking at batteries, for example, for EVs and the fact that we don't have the components that go into these battery storages. Well, we like the energy producers. Also, the refiners tend to be a bit of a laggard trade when it comes to energy. They tend to you know, make most more of their money after the barrels come out of the ground and, and on some of their margins and energy production. So that's another area of energy that we like. Sarah, on commodities, are we in a super cycle, commodity super cycle? Or it, 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 it feels like that, but it's also very different different set of cards. Commodities overall, I think it's more of just a cycle than a super cycle in that it will remain cyclical. While supplies tight in many of these non-energy commodity sectors, because there's been underinvestment, we're more worried about demand destruction. As global economies start to slow, interest rates start to go up, I think you'll see demand destruction in some of these cyclically sensitive commodity sectors. That does not include energy as much because of that producer discipline. Sarah, thank you so much. I could speak to you for hours. Sarah Malik, <laughs> there, Chief Investment Officer at Nuveen, joining us on a number of topics this morning. Now, coming up, Boris Johnson may have survived a crucial vote, but are his days as the UK's Prime Minister numbered? We'll have the details next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this, a lot of politics today, actually. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Leanne Gerens. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Russia has indefinitely banned 61 senior U.S. officials and executives from entering the country in retaliation for what it calls constantly expanding sanctions. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen and BlackRock's Larry Fink are among those on the list. Ukraine, meanwhile, says it is in talks with the U.N. on ways to export grain from ports blocked by Russia's military. Now, President Erdogan says his government will continue to cut interest rates despite one of the world's worst inflation problems. Turkey's central bank has kept its benchmark rate at 14 percent since December. Last month saw the country's annual inflation rate accelerate above 73 percent. And South Africa's Justice Ministry says that two members of the Gupta family have been arrested over in the UAE. The move is the biggest step yet in the African nation's judicial inquiry into state graft, which has spanned more than three years. The Gupta brothers have always denied the allegations. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens. This is Bloomberg Francine. Leanne, thanks so much. Now, the UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson has survived a confidence vote within his own party, but the scale of the mutiny against him suggests a danger that his days could be numbered. The vote in favour uh, of having confidence in Boris Johnson as leader was 211 votes, and the vote against was 148 votes. And therefore, I can announce that the Parliamentary Party does have confidence. Yes. Well, joining us now is our UK reporter Lizzie Burden and Bloomberg's David Merritt. I have to say the one thing that also really intrigued me today was the Telegraph, usually pro-Tories, pro-Boris, um, giving him a little bit of a slap on, on the wrist. So, Lizzie, um, good morning. So, he's won this. He's won this not by a huge amount. So, can he move on from this? Yeah, this was the, the culmination of months of discontent over Partygate, the cost of living crisis. And it's a year now until Boris Johnson can face another vote like this. So his party, his allies, will be hoping that he can draw a line under Partygate. But it's not likely to be back to business as usual because, remember, his predecessors, Margaret Thatcher and Theresa May, were out a si six months and a day, respectively, after their confidence votes. And this was a bigger rebellion than Theresa May faced in 2018. There were more rebels than his working majority was in the House of Commons before, so they're likely to try to stall his legislative agenda. He could try to bounce back and control that by uh, reshuffling his cabinet, but yeah, it's not going to be back to business as usual. No, I don't know whether there's anything that he can do. I mean, 140, 148 is quite a large number of your own MPs voting against you. So, you know, they are putting on a brave face and saying this was a decisive win, but actually he can't be feeling too good about his reform agenda and how he's able to pass that through in the House of Commons. Uh, no, it's a horrible result for the Prime Minister. However, they're spinning it this morning. More than 40% of his own MPs wanting him gone. The Labour um, 
a politician uh, has described it as the best possible result for the Labour Party, in fact, this because it keeps an unpopular Prime Minister in position and it keeps the Tories fighting amongst themselves rather than taking the fight to Labour. We have a key uh, by-election coming up in just a yep. few weeks' time, two in fact, but looking like the Tories may lose some of these seats that they gained in the past, a key one in the north of England in these red wall areas. If Boris Johnson can no longer hold on to those sorts yep. of seats, the rest of the Tory party will be thinking, why keep him as Prime Minister? Yeah, so this, this is crucial because there's something else in the House of Commons. I think the head of the Liberal Party was saying, you know, I'm giving a motion of no confidence against Boris Johnson, but that probably will go nowhere. So it's really the by-election that we're watching. Yeah, and sordid backdrops in both. In the southwest of England seat, uh, the MP was caught watching pornography on his computer in the House of Commons. In the north, the MP has been convicted for sexual assault. So paint on that backdrop, the Partygate scandal, and it doesn't look good for the Conservatives. But no. it'll be less bruising because the result is coming after the vote of no confidence, at least for Boris Johnson yeah. personally. I mean, I haven't seen Dave since, you know, the Julie, Jubilee celebrations. And for me, it was really quite shocking to hear the Prime Minister being booed as he was walking up the steps, because that's also his constituency. So does, is it that he's unpopular, but the Tories are still popular? Or, or could this be a big moment for Labour? Well, it was a really kind of watershed moment, wasn't that, him being booed on the steps of St Paul's Cathedral at the Thanksgiving service for the Queen's Jubilee amongst you know the royalist <laughs> crowd out there and I think that really struck a chord I think with yeah. a lot of MPs they also spent the Jubilee weekend back in their constituencies hearing the level of discontent and anger that is still bubbling around the country about these uh, lockdown breaking parties at Downing Street so yes this this is a po Prime Minister whose popularity has plunged across the country. That is really hitting home with his own MPs. And, you know, the, the, the agenda of the government, this levelling up agenda, that's their big benchmark policy. Yeah. That is going nowhere as well because economic growth is not being spread around the country. People are really suffering with the cost of living crisis, as Lizzie mentioned. People are ending every month with less money in their pockets. Yeah. And no government does well when the public is feeling the pinch. It so always, always goes back to the economy. Also, the headline, without a doubt, of the Jubilee was, or actually after the vote, was Therese Raphael saying, um, Mr. Johnson's still in a zip wire. Our Bloomberg, Lizzie Burton, and David Merritt. Now, coming up, Twitter repeats that it will hold Elon Musk accountable for the $44 billion takeover deal as he threatens to pull out in a battle over spam and bots. We'll have plenty more on that next. And this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now to the latest twists in the Twitter takeover saga, and there are many. Social Network, the social network, has responded to Elon Musk's renewed demands for information about spam and fake accounts, saying it will continue sharing information in line with their agreement. Well, Musk has threatened to walk away from the deal to buy the company if it doesn't prove the bots make up fewer than 5% of its users. Well, let's bring in our tech reporter, Giles Turner. Giles, so first of all, what is going on? I mean, he's going on about the spam and the bots. Is this buyer's remorse? Is he trying to walk away from the deal without paying the $1 billion, or does he just want to buy it at a cheaper price? I think both those things are key here. All this bickering between um, you know, Elon Musk, uh, you often using Twitter, this is kind of a sideshow. What he really wants is either to get a cheaper deal or to walk away from the deal because it's completely changed from when he first came in there. The price is now in the 30s uh, versus his $54.20 price he put in. So he's just instructed his lawyers to desperately try and find a way to get out of this deal Firstly, he tried to use the material adverse effect, which is uh, really looking at whether that 5% figure yep. of spam bots, yep. is it going to be greater? But that's, that's kind of irrelevant right now, I think. Well, but the problem, I guess, with that is that he, he was talking, he was going on about the bots even before he made the deal. But the fact that the share price has fallen by so much, would that not be a materially adverse effect? No, but it, it all comes down to essentially very uh, legal terms, which is why I think eventually this will end up in a law court. He has to show... Is a percentage above 5% a big deal? Is that really going to affect the deal? Is that going to affect his financing? Now, maybe if it was 90% of all the, all the accounts on Twitter were right. spam, obviously that would be a huge deal. But it's not going to be that. It's very, very unlikely. I mean, Twitter would have to be lying to us all this time. Right. I very much doubt that. So he's got to try and figure out, OK, is this percentage something perhaps 50? Can I get away with that in the law courts and say that's a huge deal? We don't know. Right. It's, a, it's not a known figure. So therefore, it'll have to be decided perhaps by 
uh, by a judge, I think, in Delaware this week. So, so the fact that the Twitter share price has fallen significantly doesn't impact this deal at all? No, not at all. In fact, this is in Twitter's favour now. Remember, we started this whole process with Twitter not wanting to get bought by Elon Musk quite clearly, trying to get him onto the board, trying to stop him taking over, and now we have completely rever a complete reversal. This deal is great for Twitter, considering where its share price mm. is. And the worst case, or rather the best case scenario for Twitter, and the worst case scenario perhaps for Elon Musk, is he has to pay a billion to, to try and get out of this this deal, but he still has no. to find a, a good enough reason to pay that billion. He can't no. just walk away. So, Joe, so basically, the fact that he did this filing, which actually legally he wasn't he meant to do, is basically to leave a paper trail. Exactly. For he's, when they go to court. Exactly. He's just trying to find any way, or his lawyers are trying to find any particular reason. He's focusing on the covenants, for example. No. We won't go into too much in detail about that. But he's essentially trying to pick holes in anything to show that Twitter are trying to stop him completing this deal. And obviously, Twitter coming back and saying, we're doing everything we can. The ball's in your court. Yeah, I love talking about legal covenants, but not before 10 a.m. on a Tuesday. Giles, thank you so much, our tech reporter there. Giles Turner, coming up, eliminate has gone from a PowerPoint presentation to a bank with a market cap of nearly 1 billion euros in three years. Well, we speak to the chief executive and founder, Corrado Pacera. That's coming up next. We'll talk, of course, about working from home, how some of these digital banks are changing the way they attract talent. The other question is also cryptocurrencies and whether we go into the digital space, what that means for a lot of the banks. This is Bloomberg. Boris Johnson survives a confidence vote, but the mutiny suggests his days as prime minister may be numbered. The RBA hikes rates by a jumbo 50 basis points, pointing to inflation spiraling higher than expected even a month ago, while Bloomberg's commodities index hits an all-time high. And Elon Musk revives his assertion that Twitter has a bot problem in a filing on Monday. The stock trades $15 below his offer price. Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Tuesday. I'm Francine Lacko here in London. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on Tuesday, the 7th of June. I know the newsroom is a little bit more tired than usual just because we're all glued to our TV screens looking for that Boris Johnson vote yesterday. Now to a conversation on markets and finance with a finance veteran. After 25 years of career working at names such as McKinsey, Olivetti and Poste Italiane, Corrado Passera stamped his name on Italian finance history when he took a role as chief executive at Banca Intesa in 2006. Now, he was one of the main proponents who helped carve out a process that ultimately led to the merger of Banca Intesa and San Paolo, where he became chief executive of what is now Italy's largest bank. He left his role in 2011 to take over as Italy's Minister for Economic Development. Now, he's moved into competition with his old employer. Well, Corrado launched Illimiti, a challenger bank specializing in SMEs. Now with a market cap of 1 billion euros, Corrado Passera joins us as Illimiti celebrates its three-year anniversary. So Corrado, as always, thank you so much thank for you. coming on. You have quite a CV and now you're a challenger bank. You want to challenge the big ones in terms of finance, digital banking. How's it going? Are Italians, you know, drinking the Kool-Aid? First of all, the best is yet to come also okay. in terms of Illimiti. <laughs> That's because what my boss says in, too. <laughs> in the first three years, we just built it. Now we have 800 uh, top quality professionals. And what is really nice about our bank is that we combine the best of traditional banking with the advantages of fintechs. Because sometimes both of them have problems, but putting them together, integrating the strength of fintechs into a strong body of, of, of good traditional credit management that makes the success. We're growing more than the market because we focus on SMEs. Yeah. A large, a huge market uh, underserved. Yeah. Especially in Italy. Let's remind everyone we have a lot Italy. of family uh, SME owned companies. Uh, and the reason is that uh, those companies um, sometimes are difficult to evaluate. And uh, underwriting a credit with them needs uh, to understand the industries, needs to understand the, the continuous uh, uh, updated performance data. Uh, and at the same time, if you close the branches, and that is what yeah. is happening, uh, uh, they lose the channel. So uh, we are focusing there and uh, we're growing. Do, do you worry, Corrado, about non-performing loans? We're at crossroads, right? Inflation is high. We don't exactly know whether there's a policy mistake. We don't know whether the spread between Italian BTPs and German boons goes up. A new wave, a high wave of non-performing um, uh, loans will arrive. That's for sure. And uh, 
actually the, the market is ready, the limit is ready for that too. Okay. Uh, uh, obviously the, the amount, the size of this wave will depend on the length of the war and will depend on the initiatives we will be able to take both at the national level and at the European level to avoid a recession. Having said that, uh, the, just taking an eye on stage two positions on uh, European banks' uh, 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 um, loans, because there there is a pipeline coming up yeah. uh, in terms of loans, and the UTPs will be the crucial segment. Yeah. We have to make sure that we follow and we manage the UTPs in the right way. They are likely to pay position because you can bring them back to performing status or yeah. they become bad. bad but debts. could it be as bad as during the crisis? Uh, it might. If it, this is a big warning you're giving. It might if the war lasts too long. And if What's we are too not. Long? Two years? One year? One year would would still be quite a long period of time. At the same time, the balance sheets of the banks are strong. The capital base of the banks are stronger than uh, at the beginning of the, of the previous, uh, previous crises. So we are ready to face with such a problem, but the wave will arrive, is arriving. Um, talk to me a little bit about how COVID has changed, of course, how you evaluate some of the loans, how you give out, um, you know, how you support some of the SMEs, and what it means also for working from home. Has it changed? Are there legacies that will stay here forever? Okay. COVID and then Ukraine changed a little bit the criteria because obviously you have to uh, stay close to those companies that are reacting, that are resilient, and some of them are very resilient. Uh, in the last three crises, uh, the selection amongst the, the SME world has been such that now most of those companies, especially the mid-sized companies, are really strong. And we see every day a lot of dynamism in terms of M&A, in terms of investment, etc. Uh, having said that, uh, there are a number of companies that are not uh, catching up. Um, new, uh, new work, new, new ways, uh, um, smart working. Smart, yeah. I mean, I love. Uh, sorry, can I just say I love the fact that the Italians basically call working from smart working. It is because <laughs> it's kind of like a message to, to your boss. Like it's smart it, it, working. It, it I can is work a, from home. A, a positive thing, especially if it is hybrid. I mean, cannot be only from home, cannot be, uh, actually be only uh, from office. But when we created the Limity uh, three years ago, uh, we gave our people since the very first day the possibility to choose between home and the office or a mixture of them. So when COVID arrived, for us it was business as usual. Business as usual. <laughs> Uh, now people have uh, get, got accustomed to uh, a, a very hybrid uh, mechanism and each team uh, inside the bank uh, decides how to organize their, their, their work and uh, uh, we will never get back to... Why are you, are you f for working from home? To give people the flexibility so that you can attract the best talent or does it also make it cheaper to you no, know, no, not no, have no. a structure where you have to have a big fancy building? We want to have people that are happy about their life. And work is such an important part of it that, that it has to be combinable, uh, mixable, uh, the two components. So uh, giving this flexibility is, is a way to say we, we realize that uh, you have problems with, with home, or maybe with uh, parents, uh, with children, and uh, uh, with other interests. So it's really. Uh, our limited way of, of working, the, the way, that's the way we call it, uh, uh, is really like that. Let's find for each of you the way to make you as easy as possible. Even the welfare me mechanism we have, each people, each person in, in Limity can design its own welfare mechanism, yeah. choosing from a sort of menu because the needs of an old person is different from a very young person, a married one from a single. So each one can design uh, also from that point of view its way to work at the uh, limit. But this is you trying to keep your employees happy or also a way of attracting talent. What does it mean for how much you, you will grow with Limit in the next three years? You attract the best, you keep the best, you motivate the best and you are doing you are proving that uh, being a, a responsible company is a real thing. Because sometimes people talk about uh, responsibility in a very generic way. I mean, these are hard evidence of the way a company proves to its own employees that uh, it cares about them. Um, talk to me about cryptocurrency. So first yeah. of all, many people, of course, confuse 
digital currencies, for example, the euro, uh, you know, a euro digital currency or a NIMBY digital currency with some of the stable coins or cryptocurrencies. Are you a believer in that? Let's make a it a bit clear okay. because uh, uh, when we talk about crypto, sometimes we mix crypto platforms Black ch blockchain kind of yeah. uh, networks, no problem. We can uh, work on it. Can be you know, an instrument uh, provided we, ma we manage them properly. Crypto assets like Bitcoin, investment kind of assets, yeah. no problem with them, provided we make sure that the retail market is made conscious. They are virtual, they are volatile, they are energy terrible, yeah. and that they can be manipulated very easily. And then we have uh, cryptocurrencies. And uh, some of them are, let me use the word illegal, the stable coins, not yet regulated, and the legal stable coins, uh, central bank, yeah. uh, digital currencies. Stable coins, not regulated, are, are like uh, free banks. Com the banks that are ready to issue uh, a currency, yeah. so that is a real threat to the monetary sovereignty of, uh, of, of our countries. Uh, so why are they not regulated? Why is it taking so much time, they, actually? To a certain extent, they should not be. They should simply be banned. Because a stable coin, uh, uh, they, are, it, it, they, oh, they should be regulated like, like a bank, and they become banks, no problem. But they don't want to be banks. So they don't want to, be, to have those limits. So they have, they have to become much more transparent in terms of the content of their reserves. Nobody knows where the money is while the central bank digital currencies like uh, the, the, the digital pound and the digital euro have, have all the advantages of the innovation of uh, uh, crypto, crypto uh, platforms, but at the same time, they guarantee all yeah. the mechanism and so, the value. Corrado, you're not a fan of a lot of these crypto So you're not uh, offering Bitcoin on it, Liberty, I'm are very you? open to crypto platform. Right. Uh, I, I think we have to be very um, uh, attentive to uh, crypto assets for retail yeah. markets. We have to be against stable coins and we have to be in favor of uh, uh, legal digital currencies, euro okay. or uh, pound, uh, digital pound. Corrado, thank you so much. Always extremely clear in the stats. We'll get you back in London in a couple of months Anytime. and see if anything changes Any, in terms so of your love right for crypto. Corrado Passera, the chief executive and founder of Illimiti, joining us this morning. Now, this is a picture for European assets. There definitely does seem to be a risk-off <laughs> mood. Uh, U.S. futures are also down. Central banks resolute on tightening policy, and that's fanning growth fears. So dollar advancing, bond yield stabilizing. When it comes to U.K. assets on the back of that no confidence vote uh, from Boris Johnson being won, but still quite a big immunity, 148 of his own MPs voting against him. We're not seeing huge reaction on, for example, cable 125.15. Coming up, more on the fallout from the confidence vote. We'll be joined by the legal and general CFO, Jeff Davies. He's up next, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now let's get straight to your Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Leanne Gerens. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Twitter says it will hold Elon Musk accountable to the terms of his proposed $44 billion takeover offer after the billionaire again threatened to pull out of the deal over the issue of bots. Musk believes Twitter is breaching their agreement by not meeting his demands for more information about spam and also fake accounts. Shares fell again in New York, further widening the gap between market valuation and Musk's offer. Now Apple has unveiled the biggest over hall to the MacBook Air in over a decade. The updated laptop previewed at its developer conference will have a new design and a Foster M2 processor from the company's own homegrown chip line. Apple also launched a flurry of new software features and services, including a pay later option that pushes it deeper into finance. And Coles in exclusive talks with a franchise group for a deal that would value the retail chain at about 
about $8 billion. Franchise Group's offer is for $60 a share. That is coal surging in pre-market trading. In February, coal said it had rejected takeover offers because they undervalued the company. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Now, the UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson has survived a confidence vote within his own party, but the scale of the mutiny against him suggests a danger that his days could be numbered. Now, these are some of the UK front pages that are covering the story. The Daily Telegraph leads with the headline, Hollow Victory Tears Tories Apart. Of course, they're usually pro Boris Johnson and pro Tory. The star reads, Carry on Pinocchio. The Time has a headline, A Wounded Victor. And the front page of the Mirror says, Party's over, Boris. Similar from the Metro as well. The party is over for Boris. I mean, it's quite incredible to see some of the right wing faction of the UK press, if not turning against Boris Johnson, certainly uh, not being pro and not proclaiming as some of his most loyal supporters, stunt reporters, have said, which is an overwhelming victory. Now, for his take on the events, joining us now is legal and general CFO Jeff Davies. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. I know you're at a Goldman Sachs conference in Rome, so probably missed all the festivities yesterday as we were all glued to our uh, TV screens to look at the vote. What does this mean in terms of the UK? Do you worry that he will not be able to pass on the legislation needed in the House of Commons? that the leveling up agenda will take even more of a backseat. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Um, I think um, we all have learned it's very difficult to predict uh, UK politics, so I, I won't go down that route, but your, your point is the right one, um, that we need to make sure that we continue with action, uh, the leveling up agenda, the health inequalities, the sort of thing we're looking to do in regeneration is very important and we all know of course that there is the the climate transition that we also need to deal with in in the wake of what's seen as uh, as the energy crisis that's been accelerated so so you're right the most important thing is is that the uk and and the government can maintain a focus on action uh, that they're able to to pass the legislation we you know yeah. as investors and long-term investors are not not concerned at this stage um you know we would see this agenda um, being something that's consistent across parties and, and we in fact work with lots of the, the local mayors and local councils yeah. where a lot of this activity happened. Mr. Davies, how uncertain do you think the outlook for 2022 is for the UK and is there anything that private companies can do to help the consumer? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, we, we've been very action focused and, and, you know, many companies go and, and do and invest. Um, as I say, we see the local mayors. We've just announced a four billion pound deal with, with Birmingham where we're going to work in conjunction with them around housing, et cetera. And we're seeing a huge demand for investment uh, across the UK um, where it's aligned with the demand. You know, so you see as I say, housing and whether that's affordable housing or, of course, we still have uh, significant uh, demand for uh, build to sell, people moving, uh, post-pandemic, reviewing where they want to be situated. I uh, saw so you were talking earlier about hybrid working, having an influence on that. And we're, we're simply uh, moving forward with all of that and continuing to invest. Um, and so I think there is a, a lot of demand. I think people... Uh, yep. There's high employment, which is uh, an interesting feature, and people feel reasonably secure, but, but are still being selective in where they're spending. So we're investing alongside these, uh, these big themes uh, to ensure that uh, they, they would be more stable. And talk to me. Yeah. And talk to me a little bit about, I know that legal and general investment management was voting against the election of certain, um, of course, Amazon directors, including the founder and former CEO, Jeff Bezos. Why is that? Yeah, that's, as you say, that's our asset manager as part of their engagement model. Um, they look very seriously at their voting on many, many topics. And governance as part of the G and ESG is one of those. Uh, they have rules and thoughts uh, around uh, the, the splitting of duties. So, for example, the chair and CEO, they voted previously against companies where they haven't split the roles. And that there's sufficient turnover 
on boards after periods of time. And, uh, you know, that was really the issue they were looking to raise there uh, as part of that and voting against it. Um, I don't think they were commenting personally on the capabilities of Jeff Bezos, but more the, the governance overall and the sort of timescales people have been involved in. Right. There's enough challenge and turnover. And when you look at working from home, and of course we talk about this day in day out for a lot of the financial companies, what does it mean for how you're running legal in general? Will it change the flexibility that you give to a lot of your employees? Absolutely, yes, and, and we're seeing that, and we're investing now in a, in a brand new office in Cardiff. That will be, uh, you know, a leading office both from environmental point of view, but also. Uh, developing that to allow hybrid working. Um, clearly, it, it differs by divisions and, and people who need to be out on building sites on a regular basis are, are not going to be working at home as often. And, you know, we've had to make sure that our operations for our 14 million customers uh, are maintained and they will quite often need to be in the office more often, but, but not all of the time. Um, but we are yep. seeing that. Um, but we're also seeing that people want to be back. And so... You know, we've got really good attendance. Um, people want to be back where they're working on projects, where they want to work together, they want to collaborate. And we do think it's important that people attend the office on a regular basis, whatever that means, whether that's two, three days a week or uh, one week in every fortnight, you know, whenever people need to yep. be back, so that they build culture. And, of course, for people to train, um, as many, many institutions have talked about, you know, people who are new to the workforce, they need to build relationships, but they also learn uh, over time from, oh, yeah. from their peers. Really interesting. Thank you so much for the conversation. Legal and General CFO there, Jeff Davies. Coming up, did Binance break securities rules as it was getting off the ground? Well, we'll have a full investigation of that story. It's a Bloomberg exclusive, and it's up next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, U.S. regulators are said to be investigating whether Binance broke securities rules by selling digital tokens just as a crypto exchange was getting off the ground five years ago. Well, let's get more now with our senior crypto reporter, Joanna Ossinger. Joanna, great to speak to you on this. I mean, there are quite a lot of issues at stake. Does it go back to how they started or does it impact how they'll carry on? It impacts both things. It's you know it's a probe not probe not only into the origins of the BNB token, which is the fifth biggest in crypto, so it's a pretty big deal, but actually into the origins of Binance itself, because the investigation is whether the initial coin offering in 2017 was a sale of the security that should have been registered with the SEC, and that's according to people who are granted anonymity to discuss the probe. Um, but you know it's also probing possible trading abuses by Binance insiders and whether American affiliate Binance U.S. is appropriately hived off from global Binance. So it's really into quite a lot of things related to the corporate operation. So, Joanna, what does this mean for the broader crypto world? Yeah, well, it means that, you know, crypto companies have to take the U.S. seriously about regulation. And also the U.S. is often you know, a bellwether for what other countries might do. And it's a reminder that countries are now serious about dealing with crypto and even things from prior years that, you know, companies might say, oh, well, that was a long time ago. We're now doing things a different way. But it is a reminder that, you know, countries are getting really serious about crypto and its impact on the broader ecosystem and even things from a prior period. Joanna, thank you so much for joining us. Joanna so, Alchinger there on this wonderful and very important story, which is a Bloomberg scoop on Binance. Now, Bloomberg surveillance continues in the next hour. Matt Miller, Kaylee Lines in New York, Anna Edwards is here in London, and this is Bloomberg. no real 
reason to be worried about a recession. I'm not sure we've seen the high yields. We may go back and test those. While we are factoring in this economic ratcheting down, we do want to take account of the fact that sentiment probably has you know hit peak bearishness as well. The market's got a settling down and being okay with what the piece, it seems like what the Fed's, Fed's doing. For the other central banks, they are still adjusting their guidance. And that guidance is, is unequivocally in the hawkish direction. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Tuesday, June 7th. Our top stories today. A surprise move by Australia's central bank. It raises interest rates twice as much as forecast, sending yields soaring. Meanwhile, the ECB will lay the groundwork to join the global fight against inflation when it meets later this week. Boris Johnson manages to cling to power, but his days as British Prime Minister may be numbered. After surviving a confidence vote, Johnson will try to turn the page. And Elon Musk appears to have buyer's remorse, but that's not enough to get him out of the $44 billion deal to buy Twitter. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kayleigh Lyons in New York. And Kayleigh, we seem on a global level to be back to worrying about higher interest rates, higher bond yields, crucially, and what that's going to do to appetite for stocks. Yeah, and of course, what we saw out of the RBA overnight, Anna, is really just fueling that narrative after that surprise 50 basis point rate hike. That was double what economists were expecting, the largest hike in 22 years in order to rein in inflation. And the RBA saying there could be more coming. They're pledging to do what is necessary to rein in inflation. So that definitely created a drag on risk sentiment in Asia overnight. The MSCI Asia Pacific Index as a whole was down the better part of 1%, but of course it was Australian stocks in particular really uh, leading those losses. The ASX was down about 1.5%. And of course you saw it really showing up in other asset classes as well. Big moves in the short end of the Australian bond market, up about 17 and a half basis points on the two-year yield to just shy of 280 on that yield. You also have the Aussie dollar uh, was stronger against the U.S. dollar earlier on, now just fractionally weaker. While there is major weakness coming once again for the Japanese yen, it comes back to that rate differential story. A Bank of Japan keeping policy easy, even as central banks around the world, including the Fed and the RBA, are getting more hawkish. So the Japanese yen at another two-decade low against the U.S. dollar right now trading at 132.77. Wow, and that rate uh, concern really weighing on risk sentiment. Certainly, uh, our futures are down right now. S&P futures off one-third of 1%, 1 and investors are buying bonds, uh, pushing the yield down a little bit, but still it's over 3%, so higher than where we were at this time yesterday, 3 spot zero one five nine. NYMEX crude changed very little from where we were yesterday, still at around 119 a barrel right now, 118. 57 for Texas Intermediate and Bitcoin losing everything that we saw yesterday and then some right yesterday it was up 5% to 31,000 and change now it's back down 5% and changed to 29,627 so it still is range bound it looks like it really hits a hard limit up around 32,000 and down around 28 we'll see if it can move out of that range Anna what do you see in terms of European movers yeah, European equity markets then, broadly speaking, moving lower this morning, Matt. Uh, again, linked to that fear about higher interest rates. Certainly the ECB looms into focus on the horizon. That meeting coming up on Thursday, laying the ground at least for higher interest rates there. Uh, this is the picture across European stocks then right now. So some of the major markets are in negative territory in France and in Germany. The London market doing a little bit better. And basic resources once again to the rescue when it comes to London and uh, the different sector, uh, the sector makeup that is helping there. So basic resources up by 6 of 1%. We saw the Bloomberg Commodities Index actually moving to a new all-time high in yesterday's session. So working that way through and some of those stocks that rely on those higher commodity prices doing pretty well. Here's the pound. The pound down three tenths of 1% against the US dollar this morning. Uh, we saw, of course, Boris Johnson keeping hold of control of the Conservative Party, at least winning the no confidence vote. But 40% of his party don't have confidence in him. That leads to questions about how long he can stay in post. And so nervousness for the markets and nervousness for the pound. Biffa, just to, just to go uh, back to something we haven't don't talk about all that much I guess uh, at the moment that's M&A because of vo such volatility in markets certainly when we saw war in Ukraine uh, starting that put uh, an end to some of the M&A that we've been talking about but Biffa in the UK receiving a bid for a New Jersey based uh, venture capital business and it seems that recycling and waste management all very topical right now and so uh, that stock up by 27% as a result of that bid approach SAS this is an airline over in Scandinavia Scandinavia's largest airline in fact the Swedish government has told the company that they don't 
want to put any more money in. So the stock, Kayleigh, down by 11.6%. They will have to find alternative sources of in income as they try to weather their way out of the global pandemic. All right, so some big movers on an individual stock level that will monitor throughout the trading session. As for what else we are monitoring today, French President Emmanuel Macron will be meeting with Portugal's Prime Minister Antonio Costa at 7 a.m. New York time. We'll also be getting some U.S. economic data in the form of trade balance numbers. That's at 8.30 a.m. Eastern. Then the World Bank will be releasing its Global Economic Prospects Report at 9.30 a.m. New York time. And finally, all day today, it is primary day in many U.S. states, including California, Iowa, Mississippi, and New Jersey just across the river, Matt. All right, we'll be paying attention to that for sure. Now let's get back to the big market moving story. The RBA Reserve Bank of Australia surprised investors today by raising interest rates 50 basis points, twice as much as had been forecast. The move sent yields soaring and was predicted by just three of the 29 economists Bloomberg surveyed. Enda Curran, Bloomberg's chief Asia economics correspondent, joins us now to talk about, I guess, 50 is the new 25 for central banks, Enda. It does seem to be the case. The RBA is certainly in that camp now, Matt. This was all about energy prices. The statement was littered with, with references to how things are changing on the pricing front there. In particular, even to only a month ago, the RBA said things had moved on faster than expected. They said they will do whatever is necessary to pull in inflation, so more interest rate hikes are coming. They also talked up the economy. They cited a strong labour market. They said that the housing market has come off a little bit, but prices are still 25% above their pre-pandemic levels, suggesting that the economy can take these interest rate hikes. So economists responded by ratcheting up their own rate hike forecast for Australia, and all the, all the indications are now that the RBA is very hawkish and interest rates are going up. It's a question of uh, what pace from here. Yeah, the rates may be very different, Enda, but the narrative so similar in many parts of the world. Thank you so much, Bloomberg's uh, Enda Curran, with the latest on Australia and linking to the global picture. Back here to the UK, Boris Johnson survived a no-confidence vote, but his hollow win shows there's a war raging in the Conservative Party. The vote saw 148 Conservative MPs try to oust him. The vote in favour uh, of having confidence in Boris Johnson as leader was 211 votes, and the vote against was 148 votes. And therefore, I can announce that the Parliamentary Party does have confidence. Yeah. Yeah. Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden joins us now from Downing Street. Lizzie, a lot of talk today about a cabinet meeting that's going to take place, whether we'll see a reshuffle of his top team, whether we'll see policy changes introduced. But so much of this wasn't about the top team and it wasn't about policy. It was about the man at the top. Exactly. That meeting will happen in Downing Street number 10 behind me now. Uh, victory for Boris Johnson, but the question is how long can he hold on for? The current rules say that there can't be another vote like this for another year. Boris Johnson's come out guns blazing, saying he wants to move on. But just look at the history books. Margaret Thatcher and Theresa May, his predecessors, lasted a day and six months after, respectively, after they won their no-confidence votes. And actually, Boris Johnson's rebellion was bigger than Theresa May's in 2018. Also, there were more rebellions, for, rebels for Boris Johnson than his working majority before the vote last night. So they may try to stall his legislative agenda now. It's, if you add up the numbers, it looks like many of them were on the government's payroll. What's most worrying for Boris Johnson, though, is the disparate, random nature of the rebellion. You've got North, South, Left, Right, Brexit, Remain, Young, Old. It's not going to be as easy to tame as one rebel faction. So no wonder the runners and riders lists are circulating today. The surprise now would be for Boris Johnson to call an early election. That's all the markets care about, really. But the focus now turns to the by-elections on June the 23rd, two on the same day, one in the southwest of England, one up north in Wakefield. Both the Conservatives are expected to lose. All right, just a couple weeks away, we will all be watching with interest to see how those elections go. Thank you so much to Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden outside Downing Street. Now from UK politics to US politics, it's another busy Tuesday for primary voting with elections across seven states, including California and New Jersey. And one issue on voters' minds, the gun debate. Jack Fitzpatrick, Bloomberg government reporter, joins us now from DC. So Jack, Congress is back in session, focusing on gun control legislation after a recent string of mass shootings here in the United States. States, where do negotiations stand? 
They're still working and they seem to be pumping the brakes a little bit on the timeline. Uh, you know, a little while back, Chris Murphy, who's the Democrat who had been uh, taking the lead in these conversations, had been saying they wanted to try to see if they could get a deal by this week. Some of the Republicans talking about this have, have slowed the timeline down a bit. John Cornyn from Texas, who's really been the Republican leader in these conversations, is saying good, le good legislating takes some time. They're trying to make sure Chuck Schumer doesn't rush them. Does not sound like we're going to have a deal this week, but it has not fallen apart. Uh, however, it is going to be a very, very limited deal if there is a deal. They're talking about things like state level red flag laws, uh, trying to strictly limit this to a measure that would focus on uh, people with a criminal history or a history of, of mental health issues rather than, uh, for example, House Democrats are going to hold a vote on something that would raise the age of purchasing a semi-automatic weapon from 18 to 21. That's not something that looks to have uh, much bipartisan support. Uh, so anything that would come out of the Senate would be quite limited. Jack, uh, inflation also obviously still in focus with um, the book out that Janet Yellen, that says Janet Yellen urged Biden to reduce the $1.9 uh, trillion stimulus package. Plus, we had an opinion piece yesterday saying Joe Manchin, um, his decision to go against the $3.5 trillion um, legislation looks pretty prudent from this vantage point. Yellen is going to testify before a Senate panel today. What do we expect to hear? Yeah, today and tomorrow she's talking to Senate Finance and House Ways and Means. Uh, e even aside from the book excerpt, which Yellen has put out a statement denying, saying she she liked the, the March stimulus, uh, Republicans have hammered away at pretty much any economists, any Democrats testifying in this kind of setting on the role of the March 2021 stimulus uh, and to what extent that has contributed to inflation. A lot of the conversation on Capitol Hill regarding inflation Inflation uh, has turned toward the midterms. It's it's basically campaign season now. Uh, not a lot of forward-looking uh, legislating, but a lot of sort of litigating politically over the role of that law and how it has played into inflation. So I would expect a fairly uh, politicized debate and certainly some questions about that book and the assertions that uh, she was on Larry Summers' side all along. Jack, thanks so much. Bloomberg's Jack Fitzpatrick in Washington. Now, in a securities filing yesterday, Elon Musk said he thinks Twitter is breaching their agreement by not meeting his demands for more information about spam and fake accounts. But behind the scenes, both sides are said to be cooperating. Let's get the latest with Bloomberg's Danny Berger. Sometimes things look smooth from the outside but are chaotic within. Sometimes it's the reverse. Yeah, like the opposite duck effect where everything's busy up top but calm underneath the waters perhaps. But yeah, what a time to be Elon Musk's lawyers. So we've talked about before how Elon Musk just complaining about the Twitter bots wasn't enough to terminate this deal. Perhaps he was trying to use it as a negotiating con uh, context. This one's a little bit more interesting because there's a covenant within the agreement that basically says that Twitter needs to supply Elon Musk with all reasonable information pertinent to the deal. Now, Musk's lawyers are saying by not giving him the details he wants on the spam bots, we're not totally sure what those uh, information is, but then that violates the agreement. And if they don't do this, then Musk will step away. Well, Twitter, for its part, says, look, we've supplied him with all the information he needs. We'll continue to do so. But again, as you say, Anna, they're working on this behind the scenes because at the end of the day, Musk signed an agreement to buy Twitter at $54.20. So that has to go ahead. I mean, there's no really reason to pull out this moment besides what the lawyers have said. Now, to be fair, it could get to a point where Twitter has to sue us to go through with this. I mean, those are some of the extreme scenarios, but the market doesn't necessarily believe that this is going to go through. That gap between what Elon Musk proposed to pay and what Twitter is at keeps widening and Twitter yet again falling in the pre-market session, Kaylee. All right, Bloomberg's Danny Berger, thank you for keeping an eye on this one for us as the saga just continues and continues and continues. Now, elsewhere in tech, at its Worldwide Developers Conference, Apple unveiled the most significant overhaul to its popular MacBook Air laptop in more than a decade. It fe features a fresh design, new colors, and a speedier processor from its homegrown line of chips. The company also unveiled a flurry of new software features and services, including an updated lock screen and a pay later function, 
for Apple Pay. Now, as for how that is translating into the action in pre-market trading this morning, you are seeing Apple shares under a little bit of pressure, though broadly we're seeing uh, high value stocks under pressure today. Apple is down about four tenths of 1% and also dragging a firm lower. A firm, of course, is a buy now, pay later company. So the idea of competition coming from a behemoth like Apple weighing on that stock, it's down the better part of 2% in early hours. One stock that is definitely not down in early hours, though, in fact, is rising pretty substantially is Kohl's. Franchise, franchise group is in talks to take over this company for $8 billion, $60 a share. It's trading at $47.69 in early hours this morning, up about 13%. And finally, Matt mentioned this earlier, but you are seeing crypto giving back pretty much all of its losses from yesterday, and that is translating to crypto-related equities, among them Coinbase, which is down about 4% before the bell, Anna. Kaylee, when we come back, we'll talk about these markets in more detail. We will uh, speak to Maria Weitmainer, who joins us, State Street Senior Multi-Asset Strategist. She often loves stocks. Does she love them when they're 22% cheaper on the NASDAQ? than they were at the start of the year. We'll talk to her about that. And more on the UK with Lord Robert Hayward, who will be joining us, polling expert and Conservative peer. What does his long experience with the Conservative Party tell us about the future of Boris Johnson and his leadership? Plus, the future of mobility, transportation and jobs. We spoke with Walmart Air Stuart Walton from the Up Summit in Arkansas. I don't think humans are going to uh, replace robots. I think humans will uh, do different things in the future and robots will take away some of the jobs that humans generally don't like to do and you have to pay people to do. And so I think that's a trend that's going to continue. surveillance early edition. I'm Kaylee Lyons with Matt Miller in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. The U.S. has warned Kim Jong-un there will be a strong punishment if North Korea conducts a nuclear test. Both Washington and a United Nations watchdog agency say there are signs that North Korea could soon set off its first atomic device since 2017. Kim's regime has been test firing missiles at a record pace this year. Russia has come out with its own sanctions. It has indefinitely banned 61 U.S. officials and executives from entering the country, among them Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen and BlackRock CEO Larry Fink. Moscow says it's retaliating for what it calls constantly expanding sanctions against its citizens. The U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission is considering a change to stock market rules involving retail investors. Bloomberg's learned that trading firms could be forced to directly compete to execute their trades. SEC rules demand that investors get the best execution for trades. Meanwhile, U.S. regulators are investigating whether crypto exchange Binance Holdings broke securities rules. It has to do with the firm's BNB token, which is now the world's fifth largest. The SEC wants to know if the initial coin offering in 2017 amounted to the sale of a security that should have been registered with the agency. Binance says it won't comment on talks with regulators. And Anna, of course, that's something that Matt and I will be digging into on Bloomberg Crypto later on at 1 p.m. Eastern time. But we have plenty more to dig into in this hour on Surveillance Early Edition. Absolutely. Every Tuesday, it's Crypto Day. <laughs> Don't miss the crypto show with Kaylee and with Matt. But yes, as uh, Kaylee says, coming up on this program, we'll talk to Maria Weitmaner, State Street Senior Multi-Asset Strategist. Is she concerned U.S. 10-year yields above 3%? Yields dropping a little today, but the trend has been higher. What does that do to her appetite for stocks? This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. A surprise move by Australia's central bank. It raises interest rates twice as much as forecast, sending yields soaring. Meanwhile, the ECB will lay the groundwork to join the global fight against inflation when it meets later this week. Boris Johnson manages to cling to power, but his days as British Prime Minister may be numbered. After surviving a confidence vote, Johnson will try to turn the page. He's already tried to appease his critics by promising tax cuts. And Elon Musk appears to have buyer's remorse, but that's not enough to get him out of that $44 billion deal to buy Twitter. The social media company has reiterated that it will hold Musk accountable to the terms of the takeover agreement. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in New York. And uh, Matt, European equity markets then just on the back foot today, uh, fretting once again about higher yields. Yeah, it doesn't look like everything is really 
priced in, does it? We're seeing the same thing here in the U.S. When you look at futures, they are down S&P futures as well as NASDAQ futures off right now about a third of 1%. Investors are buying bonds, which maybe isn't that surprising since the yield is over 3%. It's coming down a little bit, but not by too much. So three spot zero one four one maybe doesn't look bad to everyone. I know inflation is around eight right now, but you know, these are 10 year bonds. So um, maybe they have faith in the central bank. NYMEX crude off a quarter of a percent. So not a lot of movement from, we saw it yesterday at 118, 119, and it's at 118, 16 um, today. Bitcoin is the real mover here, and this, um, it bodes negatively, I think, for risk sentiment. Um, but on the other hand, Bitcoin's just bouncing back and forth between 28 and 32, really. So it's been range bound, and it remains that at 29,563. Kaylee, what do you see in terms of pre-market movers? Well, pre-market movers relate in large part to the moves we're seeing in cryptocurrencies themselves, Matt, because that's feeding right through into crypto-related equities, which benefited in a big way yesterday when Bitcoin and other tokens were higher, but now are seeing things reverse this morning as those tokens move lower. The likes of blockchain and MicroStrategy, each down between 4 and 5%. Of course, that's something we will continue to dig into later on this afternoon on Bloomberg Crypto. And of course, something else we continue to dig into or at least try to make sense of and follow as best we can is the saga ongoing between Elon Musk and Twitter and what the fate is of that $44 billion deal uh, for Elon Musk to buy the company. We know he has made a large issue of bots. He wants concrete evidence. They make up less than 5% of users on the platform. Twitter says they can't do it. Musk says it's a breach of the agreement. No one really knows if this deal is going to go through, but seriously, this market has some doubts that it will because 54.20 is the offer price. The stock is trading 1% lower this morning at 39.18. And of course, mm -hmm. Tesla, Elon Musk's company, of which he is also a CEO, down about 1%, trading at $708. This stock, Anna, is down 27% since Elon Musk first made his Twitter bid on April 14th. Yeah, the market's still skeptical. A lot of execution risk then priced in there, Kaylee. Let's have a look at European stocks. European equity markets, as I mentioned to Matt, on the back foot then, down by half a percent. The London market does a little bit better with its exposure to miners and to energy stocks. We saw that new all-time high on the Bloomberg Commodities Index during yesterday's session. Uh, so that cushions London, but elsewhere we are seeing some weakness. Also, the pound is interesting for London-listed stocks as well. Not moving as much as it was earlier on in the day. We saw it down quite substantially in the first hour of trading here in London, but down by two-tenths of one percent on the pound now. A bit of uncertainty certainty surrounding the future of Prime Minister Boris Johnson, even though he did win, of course, that uh, confidence vote. So he's safe for the short term, but what that means late, uh, later on, we will see. Uh, Biffa, this is an interesting, it's wa a waste management business. We don't talk about these very often, but energy companies, we do talk a lot, a, a lot about recycling and energy assets of all sorts. Clearly uh, a hot topic of uh, a conversation, and this one has received a bid from a New Jersey-based business in the venture capital space. And SAS, this is a, a Scandinavian mm -hmm. airline, the largest Scandinavian airline, in fact, and the stock is down by 11.8 percent they've been told by the Swedish government that that government does not want to put any more money into the business Kaylee all right Anna well let's continue our conversation on these markets joining us now is Maria Vaitmana senior multi-asset strategist at State Street Maria good morning my good morning welcome this morning was the fact that the RBA hiked 50 basis points overnight not 25 we have a Federal Reserve that is hiking 50 plans to do so again at least two more times and the market is now pricing in even odds of a 50 basis point hike from the ECB in July in a world where 50 is the new 25, how does that change your thesis on equities? Yeah, uh, uh, good morning. And I, I think that's really the point is that what we're seeing right now is a very, very pervasive inflation, uh, inflation concerns. And what central banks around the world are absolutely focused on is slowing it down. So we're going to see more hikes, more aggressive central banks. And uh, that's unfortunately not great news for equity investors. It isn't. And, and Maria, good morning. You've been very keen on equities for, for a long time. Mm -hmm. and maybe your view has moderated a little in the, in, the, in the more recent period. But tell us what kind of appetite you have for stocks and from where. Uh, yeah, so yeah, you're absolutely right. We've been quite constructive on equities for some time, and our view have definitely moderated. And I think the fact that we're seeing this uh, inflation concerns not going away, and I mean, as, as you might know, we have this daily measure of uh, inf online inflation, and online prices are not sl sl uh, slowing anywhere. Whichever way we cut the data, by sector, by country, by region, inflation is still there, which will mean that central banks will need push and push and push, and yeah, that's, that's a challenging backdrop. 
that's interesting because we had some uh, analysis out mm. overnight, Maria, that looked at a, a number of key elements within the chip space, for example, uh, mm. DRAM prices and the like, and suggested mm. that maybe some of those elements that had been pushing up prices may have moderated in recent weeks. That's not what you're seeing then. The high frequency data that you look at tell us, tells us what, that inflation hasn't peaked. I mean, uh, I think mathematically, it's probably year-on-year -year numbers have peaked given the base effects, but they're really not slowing enough to give comfort to central bankers and to give comfort to kind of, okay, inflation problem is, is, is mod has moderated. So definitely we're seeing a lot of pressure still there. And not slowing enough to give comfort to consumers or to um, help corporate margins turn back around. Are you expecting a recession, Maria? Because um, that was really the seems like the big debate over the last few days in the States. Yeah, so on the uh, recession debate, I think the flip side of this kind of fairly strong and uh, still very strong inflation number is that why inflation is so strong. And that comes back to still cash on the side, sidelines. Corporates have cash, consumers have cash. Not all consumer and lower income consumers definitely suffering the cost of living crisis, but consumer and aggregates still have cash. Cor corporate are generating very healthy free cash flows. So to us, this recession risk is a bit overstated, which will mean that economy can take more hikes and will will make inflation would not go away very quickly and will make central bank to push more and more. So probably more constructive on economies than maybe consensus, but that well, makes me more concerned about risk assets. How about um, uh, risk assets in the sense that, I, look, ISI mm -hmm. expects, I think, 4%. Um, growth this quarter, then 3% next quarter, 2% at the end of the year, and then 1% or 2% for 2023. So Ed Hyman agrees with you, no recession. But that doesn't mean that the market necessarily um, can, can get out of what looks like a bear market right now. What do you expect for risk assets? In this year. Yeah, so I, I don't disagree with this view. I think, I mean, arguably, maybe the best thing for markets would be imminent recession, and then you get a fat put, and then uh, hiking schedule is kind of reduced, and uh, uh, risk assets can rally. But that's really not our view. Our view is that economy is robust, corporate profits are fine, and financial conditions will continue to tighten, which in the short run will pressure multiples, and in the long run will, uh, I mean, Central banks will destroy demand, and uh, that, that will that will pressure profits. So, not great outlook. Obviously, Maria, for some time, markets have had to be focused on the monetary policy picture, but also one of geopolitics and domestic politics as well, which has really been front and center in the UK mm. over the last 24 hours. Yes, Boris Johnson survived that no confidence vote, but there remains a question of just how long he can hold on to power. How do you view UK equities given domestic political turmoil like that? Uh, UK equities, uh, they are the most defensive equity market. Uh, so there's uh, three components to UK equities. There are lots of defensive stocks. So you have your staples, you have your healthcare stocks. Then you have lots of commodity sectors. So you have energy, you have materials. So those two groups, they're very well supported. And then you have a bunch of financials and everything else, which we are a little less keen on. So I think on the kind of defensive basis and uh, uh, commodity basis, so UK steel is kind of a place to hide in the in, in, in in the current uh, kind of very challenging market environment. Maria, thanks very much. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Maria Weitmaner joining us there from State Street. Coming up on the programme, we just talked a little, heard Maria's view a little on UK politics. We'll get back to that story. We'll talk to Lord Robert Hayward, polling expert and Conservative peer. He's seen a number of confidence votes come and go. We'll get his perspective on what we saw last night from the Conservative Party and what the future holds for Boris Johnson. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, World Bank President David Malpass. That's at 9.30 a.m. in New York, 2.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lines in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Now, Boris Johnson survived yesterday's confidence vote, calling it, he called it himself, a decisive victory. But um, if you look at it historically, it doesn't look that great, and his days may be numbered. Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden is back and live from Downing Street with the latest. Lizzie? 
Yes, I'm stood outside number 10 Downing Street and there's been a flurry of ministers coming out of the front door, a mix of expressions on their faces, some looking pretty discontent, some saying it's been a productive meeting. Boris Johnson, of course, won the vote of no confidence last night. Uh, it's going to be another year until another such vote could take place. He's come out guns blazing, as you say, but if you look at the history books, his predecessors, Theresa May and Margaret Thatcher, lasted just six months and a day, respectively, after they won their no-confidence votes. Uh, and Johnson actually faced a bigger rebellion last night than Theresa May in 2018. In fact, he had more rebels than his working Commons majority before the vote, so it's going to be very difficult to get his legislative agenda through now. If you add up the numbers, it seems like many of the rebels were on the government's payroll. But what's most worrying for Boris Johnson is the disparate, random nature of this rebellion. You had uh, MPs from the North, the South, Brexiters, Remain, young, old, and uh, it's so random that the vote came almost out of nowhere. It was a surprise yesterday. So it's going to be more difficult to tame than some random fa one faction uh, rebelling mm. against Boris Johnson. The surprise now would be if he were to call a general election. That's really all the markets care about. Lizzie, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden reporting from Downing Street. Joining us now uh, for more on the confidence vote and its impact, Conservative peer Lord Robert Hayward. Uh, Lord Hayward, thank you very much for joining us. Um, so we were just hearing there from Lizzie, 40% of the party then voting uh, with no confidence in the Prime Minister. How difficult will it be for him to govern and to get his agenda through with that as, as, the, uh, as the situation? It is going to be difficult. Boris's greatest asset has been his style, his charisma, his oddball nature in many ways, but it's now become his biggest problem. And he is either going to have to change and change his approach and bring those 148 rebels or a fair number of them back into the tent, or else the threat of him having to go is going to continue to hang over him for a period. Um, the trouble is that bringing people back together is not part of Boris's style. So the problems for the Tory party and for the government continue. Mm. Uh, you served, of course, under Pr Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher in the 80s and in the early 90s, uh, Robert. She faced a number of confidence votes, and the history of confidence votes in general is that even if you win them, it, it doesn't protect you for very long. What does your experience of watching other confidence votes come and go tell you about what happens here? It makes me feel so old, which I probably am, but um, <laughs> it, there is no question. Uh, that this is a big problem. It's a big rebellion, bigger than was expected, even by the most optimistic rebels. And uh, it says that the problems are going to be ongoing because, as Lizzie just said, the government has a majority which is smaller, much smaller, than the number of rebels there. The rebels, some of them will say, we've made our point and they will stop rebelling. But there are others that won't unless they see a distinct change in approach from Boris. I heard something, Lord Hayward, interesting on the BBC yesterday. Um, uh, someone in the opposition arguing that other conservative leaders like Margaret Thatcher had ideologies, whereas Boris Johnson's ideology is simply Boris Johnson. Is that um, a, a weak point for, um, for the prime minister? It was his strength, but it is now his major weakness. You can't... There was a reference just now about changing policies or beefing up policies. That is not the issue. As Lizzie said, there's this great disparate range of rebels. Uh, Boris's personality and his, his approach is the problem, not the policies. And that's the difference. With um, Mrs Thatcher, it was quite definitely policies... And the same with Theresa May. It was the split between Remainers and Brexiteers, which made it incredibly difficult to resolve. This is actually a rebellion associated with personality and approach to government. OK, so if it's about the man, Lord Hayward, what is the ripple effect on the rest of his party, the rest of the Tories broadly? Um, the effect is... Many of the rebels will say they've made the point, some of them. But others will say, unless we see a, see a change, we are going to carry on rebelling and expect to see more people join us. Uh, and that is the risk. 
um, mm. that for the Tory party, the rebellion continues on. And the one person that you cited earlier on, that was cited earlier on, who survived a, a vote of confidence was John Major, who then went on to see a massive defeat at the next general election. The one thing I would pick up on is constitutionally, it'd be very difficult now because of a change in the law for uh, Boris Johnson to call a general election. Lord, so I think that's the that's the unlikely option. Of course, there are you know different issues that this government has to contend with. Um, the issue of Boris Johnson's character and his sort of trustworthiness uh, is the issue that brought on this vote of confidence. But the economy is also a big problem for the constituency, right? I mean, um, the, the inflation that they're facing and the help that they are or are not getting from this government um, will decide his popularity or the government's popularity going forward. There's no question that uh, inflation is a massive issue. There will be other issues that come along at different points. We're not scheduled to have an election for the next two years. Uh, and the problem is that Partygate, as it's called, this whole approach in relation to COVID and parties in inverted commas at number 10, will continue to run alongside the issue of the likes of inflation and how Northern Ireland deals with the protocol and the, the union in relation to Scotland. So there are some massive issues and at the same time, there's a rebellion in relation to personalities. Lord Hayward, thank you very much for joining us. Lord Robert Hayward, Conservative peer, with his thoughts on the future leadership of the Tory party. Coming up on the programme, the future of mobility, transportation and jobs. We're live in Arkansas at the Up Summit. This is Bloomberg. This conference sits at the intersection of two, I think, pretty interesting situations going on. One is dramatic increase in the technology around how things fly and what we can do to make them fly on different energies and longer and further and in new ways. Two, influx of capital. That was Walmart Air Stuart Walton speaking with Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow at the UP Summit in Bentonville, Arkansas. The invitation-only summit is bringing together investors and executives to discuss the future of mobility and transportation. Ed Ludlow is up early for us now from Bentonville uh, to tell us what we can expect. First off, this is about all different kinds of mobility, right? I know that the um, Walton yeah. brothers are, are big fans of, of flying, um, but they're investing also in startups around these kind of things. Yeah, so I mean, Northwest Arkansas might seem a bit random to some people. It is the legacy home of Walmart and the Walton family. And as you said, Stuart and Tom are passionate aviators, but they're also investors. You know, they're the co-founders of Runway Group. They're kind of very active in this community of mobility startups. That's kind of idea one. And idea two is that Stuart Walton has this vision where Bentonville and, and Northwest Arkansas is a future hub for mobility innovation. He wants more startups here. Uh, you know, the, the organizers talk about how there's a trillion dollars of asset under management represented in the room last night uh, as part of these discussions. Uh, and the hope is that it actually breeds something, that, that the connections are made and that these startups are able to invite, find investment at a time where private and public markets are seeing a lot of volatility and there's a lot of concern. And obviously, Ed, we heard a little bit of your conversation there with Stuart Walton, but you spent yeah. a large chunk of the day with him. What else did you learn? Yeah, it's really fascinating. He is he is so passionate about this area. To say that he's a passionate aviator is actually a bit of an understatement. He took me into his private hangar. In fact, he has more than one private hangar. And he has a number of World War II era propeller aircraft that he just, we spent hours going through the minutia cool. of these aircraft, which was very cool. So he has this Goodyear uh, F2G Super Corsair 1944 with red and white stripes. And last night at the party, he did a flyby um, about a thousand feet above the air, 250 miles an hour in formation with some North American Mustang planes. You know, that was a stunt. Uh, he's hoping actually <laughs> that it draws attention and that it brings in a bit more of that capital that he was talking about for further investment.
It sounds, it sounds like it's sort of a little bit like Top Gun, but, but <laughs> not quite. Ed, um, let me ask you about the, the money going into this sector <laughs> then, because clearly uh, electric planes, well, all things electric in, in mobility is a big deal. Electric planes, something that some people get yeah. excited about. Uh, and, and so that's very desirable at a time of geopolitical uncertainty and where does the energy otherwise come from? But at the same time, is there the money around with belts tightening, with interest rates going higher, uh, the Fed tightening yeah. things up? What's the, what's the investment story here? So, so I think the frustration is you look at a lot of this technology, for example, there was a, a, an electric plane that flew 1,400 miles to get here for the event. It stopped a number of times in charge, but that's just one pilot study, right? And the question that I kept putting to Stuart and other uh, hosts and other investors that I've met over the last 24 hours is, when will this be real? Are people actually going to do deals around this? And they all pointed out to me that this summit's been on hiatus since 2018, prior to the pandemic. But at that conference in 2018, they calculated that actually $500 million of deals were done, private or venture capital investments in startups that were attending. So the hope mm. is that actually the technology on display here will see investors in the room make this real research and actually put some money into okay. what they're seeing. Ed, thanks so much. Thanks for the update. Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow. And don't miss Ed's exclusive interview with the CEO of Alaska Air. That's later today at 10.30 a.m. New, uh, New York time, 3.30 p.m. if you're in London. That is it for early edition surveillances ahead. This is Bloomberg.